Um, welcome. We have many, many new faces. Thank you all for registering, um, joining us this evening. Um, I'm Ron Cavanaugh. I'm the executive director of the Literary Freedom Project, which is a uh, nonprofit based here in the Bronx, New York. We do literary programs, and one of our programs is called One Book, One Bronx. And it's basically a discussion group that we started about three years ago to really engage our community around different issues, issues around migration, the two movement, social and social justice, social injustice, um, issues that affect black and brown people in the Bronx. Um, once the pandemic started, we had to go online. As you see, we have a growing audience online. Uh, I just want to thank, if I could thank each and every one of you, I would. Um, but as a group, I thank you, one, for joining us, but also, two, just loving literature and, you know, carving out a space for books and reading in your lives. Uh, you know, it's the pandemic has been crazy. Your regular lives can be crazy. On top of that, we, we added a pandemic. Um, so that just made things a little crazier. But I just want to thank each and every one of you for joining us this evening. Um, we have a partner. And actually, we have to thank our partner. They, they actually selected this book, um, Casita Maria Center for Arts and Education. Um, Gail Heidel is here this evening. Um, they have been an excellent partner, again, trying to, you know, build community and sustain community around books and literature and reading. So um, Gail wants to say a few words. Um, again, that's Casita Maria Center for Arts and Education here in the Bronx, New York. Um, Gail. Thank you, Ron. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, so my name is Gail Heidel. I'm the Director of Creative Arts Programs at Casita Maria. And Casita was born in El Barrio in 1934 and then raised in the Bronx in the Hunts Point neighborhood since 1961. And I'm really happy to be here tonight to share that today is the conclusion of our annual South Bronx Culture Trail Festival, now in its 10th year. And the festival celebrates the culture, history, and communities of the South Bronx through live performances, visual art, and of course, book club. Um, when I was Puerto Rican, was selected by artist Olga Correa, who currently has work on view in the Casita Maria Gallery, and she selected this book to be a literary companion to her visual artwork. Um, shortly, I'll put the uh, website up in the chat uh, if you want to view the artwork, um, and I'll also share my contact information. If you're in New York this summer, you're welcome to make an appointment with me to come see the work in person. Um, and I'm also here because I want to be able to welcome author Esmeralda Santiago, um, and we're really looking forward to the discussion this evening. I'll pass things back over to you, Ron, um, to get the conversation started. Thank you so much, Gail. Um, and as she, she mentioned, um, is the exhibition, will, Gail, will the exhibition be up past the 30th or today? The exhibitions up through the middle of August. Uh, so folks okay. are welcome to email me and then we can match schedules um, so that I can welcome you at the gallery. Thank you so much, uh, Gail. Um, so we've been chatting like we're old friends and good buddies, but actually the facilitator of tonight's um, book club is Brandon Janice. Uh, Brandon will lead the conversation as she has done valiantly for the past four weeks. For those who are new to our book club and just think like, oh, you read the book, you meet one time. We, we've actually, this is our fifth meeting on this one book. We've divided the book up into sections um, and every week for five weeks, this is the fifth week, we've come together to discuss the book. So um, this is kind of a new dynamic. This is our final meeting for this book, but it's also the final meeting for um, our, our sort of reading season. Uh, we'll start up again in uh, September, but I just, I see many, many new faces and I just wanna thank you all for joining us this evening. Uh, Brandon, I'm done. It's on you for the rest of the night, Brandon. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Ron. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. This is very exciting. And I know that everyone has 
lots of questions. Um, so I won't take up too much time, but to kind of kick us off, to kind of start us off. During these past four weeks, we have been in this book club so invested in this book, but for, a very, for very interesting reasons I've noticed, not necessarily because of uh, the craft or, or, the, or the writing, which is beautiful and these very lush descriptions of Puerto Rico and the spaces where you grew up, but I've noticed that a lot of time, a lot of our conversations are spent on your family dynamic, right? The relationships you have with your parents, or maybe the lack of relationships you have with your siblings or, or your schoolmates. We're so invested in your personal life, your nickname, Negi. We talked about that a lot during our first meeting. Um, so I was wondering maybe, uh, Ms. Elsmeralda, if you could start us off by just talking a little bit about what were some of your motivations for writing this memoir. Mm -hmm. I say all the time that everyone has a memoir, right? Every, if you are alive, you have a memoir in you. You may not have a, a fiction novel in you, and you may not have a self-help book, but you definitely have a, a memoir. So um, I'm wondering maybe if you can start us off by that, by talking about some of your, your motivations for starting this memoir. Oh, okay. Well, thank you. And, and thank you, all of you, for being here and uh, accompany us uh, in this, uh, this evening. Um, it's really, it's a great question because it was, uh, I had to ask it of myself, really, you know, why would I want to do this? <laughs> you know, writing, everybody does have a memoir because they have a life, uh, but not everyone is willing to basically go into a room by themselves and, um, and cry and remember and laugh and wonder and ask. And, and it's, it's, a, it's a difficult thing to do. Um, and um, I, I did it, my, my journey towards writing memoir really be, began when I became a mother. And um, my husband and I lived in Boston at the time and, um, and we wanted to buy a home together. We were, I was pregnant with our first child. And the only place we could afford was 35 miles <laughs> from where we were because it was so expensive to live in that area. So all of a sudden, here I am finding myself the only pigmented person in this town in the South Shore of Massachusetts. And, um, and so when my baby was still a little, you know, little blob, I was really wondering what is it gonna be like for my child to grow up in this community where nobody really I mean, I, like people would, would constantly ask me where I was from, which after a while I began to realize they're not asking me where I'm from. They're asking me, what are you doing here? Kind of thing, you know. So I, that's why that's, I internalized a lot of this stuff. I mean, now they're called microaggressions. I didn't know that's what it was called, but that's what I felt. And, and I was trying to figure out how do I, um, how do I let this child know, you know, why is it that his mother is different from all the other moms in the playground? Um, and, and so I just began by asking me that, my, asking myself that question. Um, and also because I thought, you know, my child, and then I had another child and my daughter, my son and daughter, how else would they know about their mother if I didn't tell them or, you know, in some way communicated with them? Because again, they were, deep into the middle of a culture that is not the culture that I grew up in. Uh, and so I began to write personal essays and the little personal essays were published in a local newspaper that really only went to our neighbors. Um, and so that was where I began to, to, to explore uh, what it was like to be a Puerto Rican woman in the, you know, the Southern suburbs of Boston. And, um, and I was discovered on the pages of these kinds of, you know, these magazines by an editor who said, you know, these stories are so interesting and they're so new and the voices and, you know, I haven't, I don't know anything about this culture. And so it was her idea that I write a memoir. I didn't think I was writing a memoir. I was just writing these little essays that would both allow me to explain myself to my children, but also in a way to open myself up to my neighbors for them to be more welcoming of me. Um, 
and and so that's where it started it was really her idea and i remember my saying to her no <laughs> i'm not gonna do this um and then she kind of had you know gently kind of talked me into into the idea that it would probably be a good thing for me to do because I already had all these essays and because I was bringing something that she had not seen and she's, you know, she was already, you know, uh, an experienced editor and, and knew what was out there. So that's how it started. You know, I, I wish I could say that I had a flash and said, oh, my story is so interesting that I have to write a book. I did not think that way. In fact, the reason I said no to her is that I thought I'm just, you know, I'm, Nothing's happened to me, <laughs> I thought. Uh, and, and being a very, very smart editor, she said, well, why don't you start writing uh, and see where, see where it goes? And so that's when I discover that in fact, I did have a very, big, a very big story because I'm part of a generation in Puerto Rico um, living in a way that you cannot have today or that Puerto Ricans could not have until Hurricane Maria in 2017. And all of a sudden, everybody was living the way I grew up. So, um, so that's how it all started. And um, I remember saying to her, you know, the fact that I've kind of have been ignored in this culture for so many years, that means that, you know, I'm pretty sure we'll buy, you'll, you will sell 10 books, one for each one of my siblings, right? You know, and I have a lot of, I have a lot of family. They might buy books, but I just don't think. And so it was a surprise to me that it kind of, um, you know, that Puerto Ricans really understood what I was saying and, and, and that that story resonated for them. And I really learned about how we, I mean, I think how we people um, don't know really what our story is until we put it out there. And then we realize, oh yeah, that's the story. So that's how it happened. <laughs> wow, I wasn't, I wasn't expecting that story. I, I, I was expecting the big flash. I've always wanted to be a writer and I finally got, that's beautiful. That's awesome. I was, I was always a reader. I mean, I, I, it's like, um, I think you cannot be a writer if you're not a reader first. So I was a reader and I always, always, I was always, my, my siblings and my friends would just laugh about, you know, I, I would not go anywhere without a book. And, uh, and so it was, um, by the time I started writing, I real I had to learn what that means, you know, and it's hard work. Um, but it was, um, it was, it, it was so interesting, you know, and then of course, once I started writing, then I realized, oh, I like this. I like, I like this job. <laughs> so. um, I know that, thank you so much for that answer. And I know we have many, many other questions. So um, you all can, you know, use the raise hand feature, um, or if no one's talking, you're more than welcome to just unmute yourself and ask a question. I knew where it started writing um, these for the local neighborhood. Um, how, um, okay, so in your novel, it's progressive, you know, from the begin from your childhood all the way up, and it's chronologically written out. But when you started writing for the neighborhood paper, um, where did you start? Does that um, make sense? You know, it's really that's just, it's really interesting how this happened. Um, I just I, I would I was writing these essays that I thought I would put into a notebook for my kids to have when they when they were old enough. I really wasn't planning to. Um, to publish them, but I had a neighbor who was the editor of this uh, uh, weekly newspaper that was published in Hingham. Um, and it was really more like, it was like the shopper, you know, we all get the shop, the weekly shopper, right, from the local. That's what it was. And so she said, you know, I, I've always wanted to have more than just advertisements and profiles about the most recent dental practice or, or the most, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the a lost dog kind of situation. She says, I really want it to be more. And so would you be willing to, to share some of your essays? Because I told her this is what I was doing for my kids. And so I sent them to her. And so she, I think she just picked one out of the three or four that I sent her. I don't remember which one specifically it was, 
But then it was such a big reaction from the community where people were like, whoa, you know, uh, this is like in the shopper. <laughs> Somebody's talking about being Puerto Rican in this town. Um, the reaction was so positive that she then uh, hired me to do one every week, 800, 800 words maximum. And so I had to have it in on Wednesday at noon. And I remember at eight in the morning on Wednesday, I'd be like, ah, what am I gonna do? Um, but it became this practice where I realized, oh, I have 800 words. She said, as, you know, as long as there's no vulgarities or sex or anything, you know, it's a family paper kind of thing. Um, you pretty much can write about anything. And so then I began to take just wherever I went, I would just take notes about everything that I noticed if I saw something. And, and so these stories, uh, I remember writing one um, about, uh, this, was, this was happening in the 80s, by the way. So I remember this was the, the, the beginning uh, of the AIDS um, pandemic. And, and I had lived in New York, I had been a dancer and a, and a performer. And so I, I had a lot of gay men friends from that time that I had lost touch with. And so all of a sudden I was just in a panic about all these friends that are now in danger, right? So I wrote an essay about, about my concern and, and just wondering what happened to this one, what happened to that one. The last time I talked to him, he was going there. And where are these people? Um, and so that one got, again, you know, the people would at the time, you know, letters to the editor kind of thing. So the responses were so positive that I just basically felt it was a safe thing. Some people were, were not so nice, like we know in on, on online comments that tend to be uh, not, a, not the friendliest, but, um, but most of the ones that I was getting um, were, you know, they were, they were encouraging me. And, um, and so I just basically X'd out the ones that were nasty or whatever. And, and then just picked on the ones that, um, and saved the ones that, that inspired me to do something the next, the next thing. Um, I think that the, um, the beginning of when I was Puerto Rican starts with how to eat a guava. And so that was an actual experience that I had during that time when I went to the local supermarket in the South Shore of Boston and it was like, what? There are guavas here? <laughs> you know, it was, it really was like a reaction. And I, and I immediately ran to my car, my car and I just took notes of what, you know, just how shocking it was to me. And then when I come, came home, I realized I was shocked, not because there were guavas there, but because the last time I'd had one had been uh, the day that I left. And so that's how these, that's how these, um, essays evolved, you know, just from a moment of inspiration and then working them as much as I could and, um, and then eventually getting them published. Awesome. Um, I know that, is it Maritza? Yeah, just unmute yourself. Can't hear you. Oh, she's muted. Oh, she's there we go. I got gotcha. you. Hi. <laughs> I have waited, oh my God, so long to tell you, thank you for writing your book. Thank you. That's so sweet of you to say that. Thank you. <laughs> it helped me understand my mom's um, migration here. I don't want to get upset, I'm sorry. No, it's fine, take your time. I, uh, I lost my mom last year in this month last year and your book means the world to me i um every time i reread it i learn a little bit more and i swear i get a little bit more into my own grandmother's life and my mom mm. and my family i did not expect this to happen <laughs> it's okay don't worry take your time <laughs> um I also am dying to tell you that I love listening to your voice reading oh. your books in Spanish because to me, it's home. I don't have that anymore. Mm. And uh, it's home. Thank you for being so open. 
Uh, so my question for you, um, sorry, is um, was it difficult to get your family on board to share all this stuff? Mm. Like, how did you go about all of that? Because you kind of said a lot. <laughs> I know, I think they're still trying to recover from, from this book. <laughs> but, um, you know, what I, I, they knew, I told them, because we would, have, of course, you know, we would get our family gatherings and whatever, and they knew I was doing something different. I was a filmmaker until that point, and they knew that I was kind of switching into being a full-time writer. And so I would tell them, yes, I'm writing, a, uh, I'm, I'm writing my life story, I would tell them. But I never shared the stories and I didn't, um, you know, I didn't read sections to them or anything like that. Everyone got the book when it was a hard cover with a nice, <laughs> and I sent it to all of them on the same day. So everybody who, whose address I had, they would all get it. And then they, were, they would read it. I sent one to my dad who was in Puerto Rico and one to my mother, even though my mother did not read in English. Um, but I wanted everyone to, to read it and, I, and I'm glad I made that decision because some people who want to write memoirs, they fall into those two categories. The ones who interview all their family members and sort of ask for permission whether they could tell a story or something like that. And then there's the, the fewer of them is me who is, this is my story and this is the way I remember it. And so that's the way I, just, that's the attitude I took is that they are, you know, they were there, um, but they might have, they oh. might have experienced it differently. And one of the things that we often say, you know, there's 11 of us, or there were 11, there's 10 of us left, but, oh. but one of the things that, one of the things that I, that I, um, that I had to decide was, you know, how much of their lives do I share? And I just decided I'm going to share their lives if they were there when I'm talking about it. But other than that, you know, I'm not, I'm, I just didn't want to do more than that. Yes, I, I, I opened the laundry basket of all the law, you know, dirty laundry. Uh, I said a lot of things that I think some of my siblings and my parents had issues with for a while. Um, but I think eventually they came around to realize that, you know, I wasn't lying. I was not making up anything. Everything was the way I remembered it. Um, there, are, there might be some details that I might be off. Like, you know, I might say I was wearing a blue dress and my sister would say, that's my dress, not yours kind of thing, you know? So those kinds of things did happen. Uh, but in terms of the actual stories and the experience that they remember me experiencing, they were behind me. They had issues with the fact that I talk about my grandmother being a, uh, an alcoholic. They had issues with the fact that my mom wasn't married to my siblings, uh, uh, you know, my siblings' fathers. Um, there were that's just a Puerto Rican story. It's but, such yeah, a Puerto but I think story. exactly. I didn't want to. I did not want to make them who they were not. Absolutely. in order to cover up something that in fact no one should be ashamed of you, you should not be ashamed of your life you know so so those were the those were the kinds of things that i you know that i uh, that's how i did it um it's not for everyone you know i, I if i remember correctly um julia alvarez that the, how the garcia girls lost their accent i think originally that was a memoir and I think that her siblings read it <laughs> before. And so she decided, oh no, this is a novel. So she made it into a novel. That's a, that's a story I heard. I'm not sure if this is, because I don't know her well enough to ask her that question, but, I, but this happens quite often with people who begin telling their life story and decide, you know, I have to fictionalize it because I want to protect people. I didn't want to protect them because they did nothing wrong. No, they, didn't. they did nothing um, shameful. And I think, in fact, my siblings and my parents were heroic people, given their circumstances. And yes, they had flaws, just no, like they all do, you know, but um, I wanted to honor them in their full flower rather than make up, make them into something that they weren't. 
So that's, that's how I went about this process. And I'm glad I did. And I know it's still, you know, they, they are now behind me. I know that. But I know they still have issues. And, and I honor that um, and, and respect it. Um, but this is, you know, this was my story. And I'm sticking to it. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, Elaine, would you like to ask your question next? Yes, I am a huge, huge fan. I'm not Puerto Rican, I'm from Ecuador, but many of the things that you wrote about also happened to me when I came to this country in the late 60s. Yeah. That being said, are you going to continue? I have, I'm so sorry that I missed these other sessions, these Zoom sessions. This is the first one I'm attending and I apologize if this has been asked and answered, but will there be another book to continue your story? Well, there is, there is when I was Puerto Rican, and then that story is continued in Almost a Woman, which is the second yes. memoir. Yes. And then following that, this one called The Turkish Lover. And those After three books, yeah, those three memoirs take me to the age of 28. I never, ever would have ever imagined that I had that much material for three books for that period of my life. I did consider or actually started and still from time to time dip into it uh, about what happened to me when I did return to Puerto Rico after I graduated from college, after I broke up with a relationship that was very destructive for a short, uh, for a long period of time, but it, I recovered quickly. And, and, I, and I went back to Puerto Rico with a lot of ilusiones that didn't pan out. Um, and that, um, those stories are still in process, you know, because they now, they're outside of my family's purview. They, my family didn't know me. In fact, after I left home with the Turkish guy, my family had no idea what was really happening in my life. And in fact, my siblings learned about me from these books. Um, but they're, but for some reason I can't, um, I can't, I can't put it together into a book because soon after, you know, after I come back from Puerto Rico, after that summer of 1976, I fall in love with a man I'm now married to for 43 years and our lives became, you know, my life became something else. And, and I didn't think I had enough material for just what happened that summer. Um, and I didn't want to introduce my private um, nuclear family of my husband and my children until my children were adults. Because of course, then you start, because of the kind of writer that I am, I'm probably gonna be talking about things that then would upset them. And I'm so much more worried about them than I was about my siblings, <laughs> but that's a whole other issue. So I have not done that book, but I, I think about it and, and I have notes and, and I've written some essays. Um, that I make, that I keep, um, and may at some point do it, um, but right now it's not a priority. Mm, awesome. Thank awesome. you. Can I ask your question? Esmeralda, do you still go by the name Negi? In my family, my sisters and my brothers called me Negi, and then I have a dear friend in California who's a college friend. She's, uh, she's, it's really funny, we, we were in college at the same time, but we didn't meet until, uh, you know, some years afterwards. And so she read when I was Puerto Rican and she calls me Negi. No, <laughs> so, so it's still, you know, my, my, of course, my cousins, whoever is left from my, um, from my families, um, you know, my, my aunts and uncles, my cousins, those kinds of people, they still call me Negi. I have another, let me just preface that. This book I've owned like for 15 years. And then I met you in 2018 and you autographed it for me. Mm -hmm. And I still didn't read it. So I want to thank Ron for one book, one bronze. And, you know, like I have all your books, Conquistadora, The Turkish Lover, and it's going to get me to read. But my mother hardly ever spoke about Puerto Rico. She came in the 40s and you brought, you, 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 opened my eyes to Puerto Rico in those days. And every time, you know, I go to Puerto Rico, La Isla del Encanto, the beautiful paradise, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, how did my mother 
past her time and you kind of brought me closer to that because it wasn't a paradise for a lot of Puerto Ricans. Right. And, you know, Maritza had me crying too. And, you know, you really, you, you, you know, you truth, your truth made us all proud of who we are. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Well, it's really interesting because after my memoirs came out and they came out in Spanish and my mom and my dad were actually, they could listen to, to the stories and, and you know, um, I began to interview them um, because, I, you know, they were getting older and, I, and they were much more willing to tell me about their, like what my father used to call them, nuestras, nuestras penurias, <laughs> nuestras penurias and tribulaciones, you know, he was, he was poetic. And so, so I started um, interviewing them and I have many, many hours of interviews with my parents and I'm actually working on a novel based on their stories. So it's the generation before me, because I think, you know, Puerto Ricanos, we, we, we're, our, our culture is changing so, so rapidly. And I think it's important for us to honor those ancestors who did go through all those penurias and tribulaciones, you know, and we don't really, our, our literature doesn't really necessarily reflect that because our literature until very, very recently was written by wealthy white men because women were not educated. They were not sent to school. They were not, it wasn't that they weren't educated, but they didn't let, they didn't, uh, you know, give them letters. So there were no, not too many women who were able to, to do this, to tell these stories. And the ones who were literate were from the upper class. And so they were, they were either writing about their class or they're looking down on us from the gaze of somebody who's up here. And so, so that's one of the, that's one of my issues, <laughs> which I get emotional about, um, because then what happens is in, in, in the literature of Puerto Rico, um, or at least the one that's taught in the schools and that my siblings, when they went back to Puerto Rico, this is what they read about, it's very romanticized. So there are no penurias there, <laughs> no tribulaciones, you know? I mean, there are very little um, because it's being looked at from a different angle. So, so I'm, I'm hoping, you know, I have to stay healthy and live long enough to finish this book because it's important to me. That to me is like my gift to Puerto Rico. Hi, listen, I'm on this Esmeralda Zoom. I'll call you back. Okay, sure. I don't know what I heard. Okay, so yeah, so that's so that's what's that's what's um, yeah that's what's happening with that. And thank you for saying that, and that it's that you appreciate that I'm writing about a time. You know, again, you know, it's just it's a diff, it was a different time, and and we went through it, and we got through it. <laughs> you know? Right, right. Teresa, would you like to ask your question? I know you've been patiently waiting. Absolutely. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I'm so excited. I love hearing everyone's comments. Um, my question for Senora Esmeralda, I'm so excited. Um, I'm a school teacher, high school, and your book has been very popular as a suggested reading in high school, especially now when we're looking to have more diverse voices heard um, in the classroom and the school curriculum. And since I have this wonderful opportunity to ask you, um, is there any message that you would like to share with like the young high school readers and writers about the writing process? Yes, yes. This is the thing that I would tell any young person who wants to be a writer is it's so much more important to be a reader than to be a writer. Um, it's a lot, uh, you know, to, to, to read everything because ultimately you're your first reader. <laughs> so you have to have a very broad education in literature, even to begin to understand what you're writing about when you finish your first draft. And so I, I tell them, read everything you can, write the, the draft and let them be messy. The draft does not have to be perfect. In fact, it only has to be perfect when it goes into the hands of your reader. There are many other opportunities to make it better, but mm -hmm. the first draft is that is the one that's loaded with your emotion, and it's loaded with all the themes that you don't even know you have until you have your 300 or 400 or 600 page draft, and then you start winnowing and cutting and 
changing things. And then you begin to understand why I'm writing this book. So reading is essential in order to make that process uh, helpful uh, for a writer. If, you know, and I hear from a lot of people who say, oh, I love to write, but I hate to read. I'm going, well, you know, you're not a writer then. Right. <laughs> you're a scribbler, <laughs> you know, that's it. You know. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Bill. Michael, would you like to ask your question? Your mic is muted. I just wanted to tell you, Esmeralda, that um, I've taught your book three times in my class at the university level, and I'm mm. going to teach it again in the fall. And um, I teach it from the point of, I emphasize high, cultural hybridity, and I also emphasize language, Spanglish, and, and such. And um, because I can relate, because I'm a hybrid myself. I know we talked a little bit before this all started. But um, so my question is, uh, Negi, Negrita, ¿por qué no se escribe G-U-I en vez de G-I? Uh, phonetically. <laughs> bueno, uh, I used to write it N-E-G-U-I, which is the correct thing when I was in, in Puerto Rico. And then I became a teenager. And then all, everybody had, you know, her name was Daisy. There would be a little Daisy over the the, the, the point over the eye. I mean, we just teenagers, you know, you just want to look different. You want to do things differently. So I started doing it that way. It was really strictly a teenage thing because I thought it looked better and, and that's the way it stayed. But technically it's N my mother and my father, when they wrote to me, they wrote N-E-G-U-I. <laughs> so. Very cool. Does anyone else have a question? Someone that hasn't spoken up yet? Carmen, are you saying yes? Yes, yes. <laughs> I'm not too um, techy on the Zoom thing. I just know how to get on. <laughs> no, um, so yeah, I really don't have a question more. Um, I wish I could just have like one-on-one -on -one time with her, but um, Marita had, you know, I'm glad that she has started off because she, you know, I know how the thing about getting emotional about mom and stuff. My mom passed away, it's been maybe like 13, 14 years now. Um, and my dad's maybe like four years. Um, so I know that I know that feeling. Um, I've just gotten over it recently where I can actually talk about them and not get so emotional. Mm -hmm. But um, with that said, um, the first time I got to read your book was um, my mom introduced me to to your book, I think I might have been about anywhere between nine and ten years old. We had our own little book club. She would read books, and then she would pass them on to me to read. Um, so from then, um, you know, I had that book forever until you came along with the other books. And I, I don't know if you can see them. I, I do have the collection, <laughs> and I do read them over and over again. And um, I was born here in New York in the Bronx, but you know, these stories, you know, even though I was born here and raised here in the Bronx, in my home, I was raised Puerto Rican, the foods and stuff like that. Um, the way we ate, you know, the way we spent Christmas and New Year's and everything, it was just if it would have been in Puerto Rico. Um, your story resonates in different ways because what transpired in your household transpired in many households in that time. Um, my grandma had 10 kids. Um, she wasn't married, um, you know, going into your other book. I'm sorry, it's not like I'm rambling, but I've been wanting to meet yeah, you for know so what? long. And, and I'm so glad, but let's let's hold off any comments yeah. um, for, okay. towards the end. So anyone who has a, an actual question for Esmeralda, let's let's try to give okay. those questions prior. Well, I would just, my only question would be, I know I, had, I missed her in like 2018. I think somebody that was correct last time in New York City. So that will be something I would want to know if she's going to um, have another book signing once we're in the clear to be, you know, in yeah. gatherings again and um, and just an, another book reading. You know, we're going to do the book again and continue with The Turkish Lover, you know, right. Almost the Woman, and of course, The Conquistadora. Okay, yeah. So, so any dates for any, a, a quick answer, Esmeralda, any dates coming up? No, there's nothing, no, nothing, no yeah. uh, public, like, 
personal yeah. appearances like that yet because people Long are time. still um you know concerned mm -hmm. about those issues so yeah. um the when i get i do a lot of zooming but not right. everything is like this is, and thank you ron and uh, Mika yes. Sita, that this is actually open to the public uh, so that anybody can come in and, and listen and share and be part of the, mm -hmm. of the conversation. So I don't have anything coming up in the near future now that the summer mm -hmm. things kind of quiet down. And it's good for me because it gives me a chance to, to write most of, you know, of most course. of the day. Um, nice. But I think as soon as things open up, I do post extensively. I put it on Facebook, on my page. I put it on my, um, my uh, website. And so I try yeah. to let people know um, where I am, if it's open to the public. A lot of the events that I do are not. Um, and that's just the way that the sponsors or the people who arrange it do it. So as soon as something's open, they will. Technically, you, you hear it first. <laughs> Technically, I have a book coming next year. Um, yes, that was my next question. I'm still working on it. So um, All right. I'm trying very, very hard to make my deadline yes. so that it will be published next, either next summer or next fall. That's the title. Um, and then by then, hopefully, oh God, I will yes. be out, you know, I'll be out <laughs> talking, be talking to people and giving you hugs and <laughs> just so excited about that. So. All right. So that was my next question. Yes. yes. So I'm, yes, I have an awesome year to look forward to. <laughs> Definitely. Thank you. Darlene, I want you to ask your question next. But since yeah. we're all here, um, Esmeralda, if there is any section of the book that you um, would like to read for us, um, that would be that would be awesome. I wish I could, but I I I, uh, I don't have the book in front of me. That's, it's in another it. in my library at. Uh, and Esmeralda and I spoke about this earlier. I should have mentioned that she doesn't have access, quick access to the book, so she can't read from the book tonight. And I should have mentioned that in the beginning. Apologies. Yeah, no, all good. Um, Don Lenny, do you want to ask your question? Maybe just a question would be great. Yes, thank you. Um, Esmeralda, huge fan. And um, wondering what your thoughts are on being called Negrita by your family. You look really light skinned to me. Yeah. Um, but I always got in the same thing because I am also referred as the Negrita in my family. Us Dominicans say Prieta, Prietica, or Negra. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but interesting to know what your thoughts um, with that. I've always been considered or not considered Dominican because I'm so light skinned. Uh, they say, no, you look Puerto Rican. And I'm like, no, <laughs> in the islands, we got all colors. But right. just interesting to know if you've gotten any. Um, comments on being called negrita when you know your your skin is yeah. more pale it was really than the normal negrita. i mean i think when i was in puerto rico i probably was darker because <laughs> now i don't go out as much um so probably i was and i think that name actually because i asked my dad and my mom why did you you know uh, my some of my siblings are a little bit darker my my father was black my mother is very fair uh but black hair and black eyes so so they so they're a real contrast right so um so when i was born i was actually a, one of these blue babies i i was uh, you know i almost died because the cord was tied and you don't want to hear the details but anyway i was actually a blue baby and so of course you don't call a child who is blue a blue baby you call them una negrita because i look you know darker um and I think that that's where it came from in, you know, my, I was darker than my mom. That was pretty, the only reason I think I was closer to my father's family, all of whom were Afro-Caribbean and my mother's side of the family were all Europeans. I don't know how many generations um, uh, away from, from Iberia. Um, so I think it really, it was just when he called me Negi and he was the one who did that, um, it was really to connect me closer to his family than to her. Um, and I think that that's, that, was re that was the reason. Because um, I, I mean, I remember looking when, when I was old enough, or when I had a mirror. I mean, we, <laughs> there was one little mirror that only my dad could reach, para feitarse, right? So we didn't, it's not like nowadays. So, um, so when I, you know, I would look at myself and I'm like, you know, I'm not darker. I'm, my, I have other sisters who are darker, you know, so why am I, you know, La Negrita? 
but that's the way he called it. And I considered it, you know, that's what we, that's what, at the time, mi, mi negrita was an endearment. And so I go, I, I adored my father and that he called me su negrita was like, oh, the biggest, <laughs> the biggest compliment. But yeah, it's strange. Um, I, you know, I've never, I've never, I've never had, I've never re received the kind of comments or humiliations or nastiness or microaggressions that I think some of my siblings get because they're darker. Uh, and yet I'm the one who, who's carrying that name. So, but yeah. And then um, there's a couple people that have not asked a question yet. Thank you for that um, question, Darlene. That was really great. Um, but Myra is having trouble raising her hand, but she would like to ask a question. She's been waiting patiently. So go ahead, Myra. Hi, um, thanks for joining us. I think I was like a teenager when I read your first, the Turkish lover, so I read it all out of order. Um, <laughs> but a quick question for you. Um, I was born in the States, but my parents are from Honduras. And I know you wrote these books and you wrote the essays, it sounds like in English, Mm -hmm. But when you're thinking about these stories or even outlining them, and I think there's power in language, right? Um, do you sometimes outline, outline them in Spanish? Do you start in Spanish and then revert to English? Because even though, um, like, I was born here, but I was the only child of my parents who was born here, there's a lot of memories that I think of in Spanish because that was my first language. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I find myself translating it mm -hmm. or trying to translate it in English. Yeah. So I'm curious about that aspect of it because I think, you know, when you speak another language, you, you find that other language a little bit more powerful. Right. For me anyway, no disrespect to any English native speakers. Yeah. Um, than English. No, I understand. Um, I actually, you know, I, I talked um, a little bit earlier about a first draft. And my, my first drafts, if you are reading my first draft, you have to be bilingual because I'm free with the first draft to write in English, in Spanish, in Spanglish. I know a little French, I've heard a little German, and I have a few Turkish words from the Turkish lover. So I would just put it in the language it came in in the first draft. When, when you get the book, when you the reader and get the book, I have been through this and have made these decisions about when to introduce which language at which point. Um, and so that's when that decision is made. But in a first, when I'm first writing, it just, I mean, sometimes it comes in symbols. <laughs> I mean, it comes in drawings, it comes in sketches, you know. Any way that I can express what I'm trying to say in a first draft is allow, allow that from, from me. And this is what I have learned um, is, is, is the way my process works. Other people would find that too messy or too confusing or whatever, but I, I, have, I find comfort in, me, in, in messiness around me as long as I'm clear up here, right? And so, yes, I do, um, I outline and I do outline and I'll do it the same thing. You know, if it comes in Spanish, it'll go in Spanish. If it comes in English, it comes in English. In the case of the essays that I was writing, um, you know, I have never had a Spanish speaking editor. My editors have all been North American monolinguals. <laughs> so, um, or, well, actually one of them speaks French, but you know, but they, they are not, um, they, if I wrote it in Spanish, like Isabel Allende writes in Spanish and then she has a very long-term translator and then it goes to the translator. Um, I don't do that. I just throw it all in there, you know, and then I make the decision. And because my, because my editors are not in uh, Spanish speakers, then I have to deliver my books in the language that, that my editors can understand it, right? And then it goes to a translator. In the first two books, I did the translations and I realized, you know, there are so many unemployed translators who are so much better at this than I am, you know, and I need time to write more books. And so, it, it, so then I've made the decision to just have 
a trusted translator that I work very closely yeah. with. Um, um, Esmeralda, I became a fan of yours about five years ago when I was in a bookstore with my niece who just loves reading. And all I had to do was see the cover of when I was Puerto Rican. And I mentioned to her, I need to read that book. Mm -hmm. And she bought it for me as a Christmas present. And that was the beginning of it all. It was like, I have to read all of her books. So she slowly, you know, gifted them to me. And now up to Conquistadora, which is absolutely amazing. So I have read them in order. And um, I just want to know, you know, you, you know, you were born in Puerto Rico, you were uprooted, you came back. Do you frequent the island? Do you go there periodically? Do you have a home there? Because you know, I, I was uprooted and I was fortunate to buy my great grandparents' home so that I can, you know, go there, you know, year after year and keep it in the family. Mm -hmm. So did you also do that? Because that's very important. No, uh, my people come from um, landless campesinos. We never had we never owned you know, we didn't, we didn't have land, we didn't have a finca, none of that. We, my family was really on both sides, actually, very, um, very humble. Uh, you know, my father grew up in a choza, that's, that's how he described it, una choza, you know, in a little boyo. Uh, and, and the places that I lived in, in Puerto Rico, were really in the poorest, poorest neighborhoods of Santurce and Tuabaja. Uh, so, so I don't have a place in Puerto Rico. I had a sister who still lived. Everybody else is in the United States or in other parts of the world because my siblings are really now scattered globally at this point. Um, and uh, so when my sister was living in Puerto Rico, when my father was still alive and when my mother was still alive, I would go to Puerto Rico much more frequently than I did. But the three of them are gone. So I don't have, I really don't have a place to, to stay unless I stay at a hotel or, you know, Airbnb, whatever one does. So I haven't, I haven't been going as, as often as, as I would like. Um, I was, I think before the, the event began, we were talking about, um, I finished uh, Conquistadora in my uh, sister's condo in Arecibo. She and her husband had a house down the road and then they had this condo, which they used for their children who lived in, uh, in, in the metropolitan area. When they came, uh, that's where they stayed because my sister and her husband had a smaller place. So, um, so I, I was there for you know, several months, I think almost five months uh, writing, finishing that book. Um, but I no longer have that place when she passed away and the family kind of scattered. And, and it's, it's a big, it's very sad for me, you know, because I, I wish I could spend more time there. But with even though you're all so supportive and you've bought my books and thank you, I am not a wealthy person in, in terms of being able to buy a condo or anything like that. Um, maybe if the next one is a really huge bestseller, I'll get one. Um, but, you know, you can always dream. But I don't have that. <laughs> I don't have that. And so I, I just go either when I'm invited for an event, in which case they, I stay a, little, a few days later or, or come a few days or, um, earlier than the event. Or if I have to do some work, um, I'm very connected with my um, so a professor at Sagrado Corazon University. And so a, few, a couple of years ago, she arranged for me to stay on the campus for three weeks and they have a little apartment there. And it was fantastic because I was able to do my research that I needed to do in Puerto Rico and be there <laughs> and, um, and, do, and, and not have to worry about, you know, oh, it's costing me $300 a night. I mean, it is expensive to rent in Puerto Rico. Um, and, and I have learned that I, re I can't afford it, frankly. Uh, I can't afford to do it uh, as much as I'd like to do. Yeah. Well, I can tell you, Esmeralda, that when I fixed that little house that I bought, because it's in poor condition, I will invite you and I hope that you will accept. <laughs> it's uh, in a little fishing village called La Parguera. It's oh, absolutely beautiful. We're in, you know, street number two, house number 10. So it's right in the middle of everything. And I hope that, you know, we would 
you know, be able to host you one day. Thank you. Thank you so much. And oh, I really oh, yeah. appreciate that. <laughs> you, you and I will to. take you up on it. Yeah, yes, take, all, take all, all of us. us. Yeah, yeah. 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 All of us. It's an honor for Yay. me. Yay. All right, Ron. All Thank of us you. go. I have had, yes. I'm very lucky that I, I have had, um, you know, friends who have, um, you know, a place in Puerto Rico or a condo or something, and they have they have been very very generous in allowing me whenever they don't use it or if they are not renting it uh, for me to to stay there. But I think um, almost everyone who has a place now is doing Airbnb, so I no longer <laughs> I no longer have access to these places. But thank you. I yeah, you're very it. welcome, and it would be you know free of charge because I would like to be there with you to. To partake and talk yeah, with you, to know you, talk about your books <laughs> and, and your life and and all of that. So all right. let's um y'all can talk about that maybe offline. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, anytime you're in the bar, we're going to be texting her, right? <laughs> the net has yeah. been waiting very patiently, so um please do ask your question whenever you're ready. So um, I just wanted to say thank you for being such a wonderful voice for what, you know, young women, really, your books are amazing. And I read uh, the first book when I was a young woman at 19 years old, and then I reread it for this book club. And I also lost my mom a few years ago, and it brought me back to, you know, the cultural things that we, the things that we go through. So my question to you is, when you were writing that book and the other following memoirs that you wrote, what was your writing process? Was it when you go back to those times in your life that are painful, right? Yeah. How do you process that so that you can get it on paper in a cohesive way so that your readers can, I mean, because I have to be honest, I can close my eyes and visualize, you know, the eating of the mango or even just the interactions of your parents and the, you know, and some of the painful things that you went through in your childhood, I can, I can feel it. Yeah. How do you, how do you get to that point as a writer? It's that, is that, that's a tough question. Yeah, I cry a lot. <laughs> I do. Um, I, you know, my, my process, I think every writer has their own process, right? And, and you have to value it and protect it. And, and I try to do that. Um, and, and my process is to just write, to not be afraid to write it down as a first draft. This, and this is where many writers get stuck because they write it down and they, then, then they go to the first because the first sentence wasn't perfect or whatever. I don't care about perfection at that point. I just write it. And very often, it's, it's like being in therapy, you know? I mean, I, I, that you have to be open to the process and you have to be honest and truthful. And, and so I do that. And then when I have enough, enough pages that I can then begin to, fix them or make them prettier or whatever. But I do, I, I, I cry a lot. I mean, with, with the memoirs, I, um, I had, oh, I mean, I, I, I really, I go away to write by myself. I leave my family, I leave my husband, I <laughs> left my kids. Um, and, and just to be by myself for a long, long period of time for two reasons. One is the focus of what I need in order to do it, but also because I go through emotional turmoil that I don't want to inflict on the people around me. Um, because I really do, I'm like a method writer, you know? <laughs> um, I, just, I just do that, do it that way. And I'm finding that that happens also in my, in my fiction, you know, that um, I can't get into a character, uh, I can't write about a character without feeling what that person felt like. And, um, and, and so I try, to, I try to be them, you know? Um, and that's, where, that's how this process began with, with when I was Puerto Rican, especially because I remember saying to my editor, whom I adore, by the way, she's like 90 years old and she, she just is so wise, you know? And, um, and one of the things that I remember her telling me is just write it, don't, explain it to yourself, don't try to critique it, don't try to fix it, just write it down. And so that's, that, that's the, um, 
that kind of advice is the one that I follow even now. So like in the book that I'm writing right now, there is a character who, who, who suffers through an, a sexual assault. I have not had an experience exactly like hers, you know, but I have to place myself into that moment of this fictional character, what that might feel like. And that's where reading many, many books, talking to people, listening to people, that some of the things that maybe I didn't experience, I can understand and feel empathy and, and sympathy with, and then I can write about it. Um, so that's, that's, you know, and that's a process that you develop as a writer, um, you know, over many, many, many pages that don't work. Uh, or, you know, in my case, I get very emotional with my writing. And uh, I remember at, at an event not too many years ago, this young man, uh, when we were all, you know, in person, he uh, raised his hand and he said, what, you know, when I'm writing, sometimes I just get so overcome with emotion, you know, and I don't know what to do. And I said, the same thing happens to me. And what I do is I just leave it. I have to get away from that much emotion because it's, it could be dangerous, you know? Um, and so I walk away, I'll take a walk, I'll go get some tea, I'll, I'll read a poem just to kind of bring myself into a, a state in which I can write rather than live <laughs> the experience. Uh, but that, but those, but that doesn't go away. When I start going through the manuscript, I remember, oh, I was really upset in this section, you know. And then I try to get in it uh, again in order to make it real for you, the reader. Um, so that's it's you know it's a messy process. It's a really messy process. And I think if you're not, if you're not, if you don't protect yourself, um, especially if you're writing memoir, if you don't have a way to protect yourself from your own emotions and your own memories, it could be damaging, you know. Uh, I, I really, I think it could be, but uh, so I try to protect myself from that. And I try to be aware when it's just, I'm going too crazy here. <laughs> I'm, getting, I'm getting too upset. I need to calm down before I can go forward because otherwise uh, it's not gonna be good for me. So. Uh, and that, you know, that's something that you learn from experience. Mm, wow, that was really insightful. Thank you for that, such a generous answer. Um, Liliana, are you ready for your question? Yes, I am. Uh, thank you so much for joining our space tonight and for sharing your story. Um, throughout the book, Flav, one of the main conversations that we often came back to was um, back to the title, when I was Puerto Rican. This idea of losing the Puerto Rican identity or what it means to be Puerto Rican. And, you know, something I often thought about, thought about even through reading the stories and I struggle is like hearing thought, uh, conversations of family say to me, oh, you're not Dominican enough or you're going to different settings, or you're not American enough. And so reading through the end of the story, I still saw a lot of your roots still in there and very prominent of, um, of your values and your culture that was you know, taught to you and you grew up, grew up. So after so many years now, the, you know, after writing this beautiful story, um, do you think you um, have lost a lot of your Puerto Rican roots um, and now looking back and, you know, what you consider and in, in your identity and such? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if I, I, no, no, if I, I ramble a lot. I understand the question. No, no, I understand. Thank you. Thank you so much for actually, because this is one that uh, very many people are curious about. Why is it in the past tense, you know, um, and, and actually some people are offensive. I've, I've, they're offended by the fact that it's in the past tense. Um, but uh, I have, I can tell you why, and I'll tell you what my journey has been with that. Um, when I wrote my, when I wrote the first draft of when I was Puerto Rican, it was called something else. I don't even remember. I kept changing the titles over the 
course of the two years that, that it took me to write this book. Um, and then at the very last moment when I had to commit to the title, um, I really started to ask myself, you know, what is this book about? Um, and, um, and I answered my question is going, well, this is about a childhood that one cannot have in Puerto Rico anymore. I was my most Puerto Rican in the 1950s, being una jibarita, living in a rural part of Puerto Rico with very little connection to culture outside of that barrio, Macum, which by the way still exists in Tua Baja. So, so my, my culture was very much um, what was really the way it was in the 19th century in Puerto Rico. It was still like that. Um, and so, so that was one of the reasons when that I, that I put the past tense is that I was my most Puerto Rican then because all I knew was being Puerto Rican. Um, I didn't know from, you know, until, until the Americanos came in to tell us to eat broccoli, you know, I, I had no idea who these people were. So that's one of the, that's one of the reasons why it's, it's in the past tense. The other reason is because when I did go back to Puerto Rico, when I was, um, after 12 years of being back uh, on the island, uh, los Puerto Ricanos y las Puerto Ricanas used to say to me, you're not Puerto Rican. <laughs> you're, I mean, like this, you know, <laughs> like, uh, you're, you're not Puerto Rican, you're, you know, you're New Yorican, which was, which was a new word to me. I hadn't, I had been living in Texas and then Syracuse and then Boston. So I had not heard that word until I went to, to Puerto Rico. So I'm going, I'm not New Yorican, I was born here. And so it, it's like they had to explain it, but it was, they put it as if they were giving me like this big insult by calling me a New Yorker. And, I, and I'm like, going, wait, two, you know, four, five of my siblings were born in New York. So it was really confusing. And not only that, but then they were living in Puerto Rico at the time. So it was so confusing for me. So that's one of the other reasons why I felt like I had to make a statement about my Puerto Ricanness. Um, and then, um, the, you know, so, and then the third, the third reason was that I think we need to talk about these degrees of Puerto Ricanness or of Hondurasness or Dominicanness or Italianness or whatever, that the people who didn't leave the place, they feel somehow that they are more 100% whatever than those of you who have not stayed there. And my experience was that the Puerto Ricanos y Puerto Ricanas living outside of Puerto Rico were doing everything possible that we could to preserve this culture in a way that the people who were living there were not because they took it for granted. So when I arrived in Puerto Rico from Boston and I'm like, wait a second, what happened to all the cafetines and chinchorros? <laughs> you know, <laughs> was this everybody like Sunday afternoon Everybody's at McDonald's and Burger King. They're not at Abuelas, you know. The, the culture shock, I had a greater culture shock returning to Puerto Rico and realizing that that culture had been so washed down. And so then I would say that to the Puerto Ricanos that would try to make me feel, who, who did everything they could for me to feel badly about not being there all the time. I would say, look, you know, I didn't do this. <laughs> you guys have been here and you did this uh, or you allowed it to happen. Uh, we are out in Chicago, we are in Boston, we are in Syracuse, we're in all over in the United States, we're in other countries, in Hawaii. So just holding on to our culture in such a way that is so tight because we have to, we have to. Uh, but but you haven't done that, you know. You're not doing that, and so so that was th so. I just wanted that discussion and that conversation and that talking about about what has happened in Puerto Rico by those Puerto Rican who looked uh, Puerto Ricans were there who looked down on those of us who are not there. And I always say I didn't leave Puerto Rico. A mí me llevaron, 
know, my mother dragged me to New York. I did not make, they said, mommy, I want to go to New York. And she said, okay, that's not the way it happened. Um, so, so even for those of us who we had no choice uh, as children or because our jobs required it or because our education demanded that we had to be in an arbor to, you know, whatever, um, you know, those kinds of decisions does not take away our culture, our values and our history. I am still carrying the history of Puerto Rico on my shoulders, even though I'm living in upstate New York. You know, so so that that's one of the that's that so I that's why I defend that that um, that title because I think it's important for us to have that discussion and to and for Puerto Ricans to realize that we're not over there not thinking about them and I think that they really really realized it after Hurricane Maria because La Diaspora we stepped up in a way that they didn't expect on the island and that they're still like amazed, we did. We stepped up in a way that they, 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 real, they owe us really, frankly. <laughs> so, so I think, um, yeah, so that's, that's why that's the title. And, and, um, and I, I think I have been told, you know, people have actually, to my face, I say, I will never read that book because it says when I was Puerto Rican and I say, you are, you are making a decision on this book by the cover just like you would look at me and because I'm light skinned, I'm not black enough for you, you know? So, so sorry for you, you, <laughs> you have a problem. Um, and that's, and that's the way I, that's the way I deal with it. Wow. That's really Thank amazing. you so much for sharing that. Um, you hit a, <laughs> a lot of these topics in conversation, a lot of this, you know, the common struggle of a lot of people who they leave the Island, whether we're by choice or not and having, to you know think about that so thank you well you're welcome you know one of the things and somebody asked earlier about what i would say to young people is you don't owe anybody to defend your own cultural identity to anybody to the people back in the island or the country that you lived in you don't even have to you don't even owe it to your parents you only owe it to yourself and uh and so don't don't let that um, other people's problems be your problem. You have enough problems. You don't need theirs. You know, you don't need their racism. You don't need their misogyny. You don't need their homophobia. You don't need that in your life. You have enough going on. So don't take that on as a burden. Um, I think, um, you know, be who you are, whoever that is. I am a Puerto Rican who danced Indian classic temple dance, Indian temple dance for 17 years. Does that make me less Puerto Rican? Because that's what I was dancing and my music was Ravi Shankar and those and the tabla instead of the tiple, you know? That's ridiculous. It is ridiculous to make those kinds of distinctions. Um, so, so we need to continue um, reminding people that everyone is different and everyone has a different definition of who they are. And we have to respect their definition of themselves, not try to impose yours on theirs. Right, right. Wow, that's so amazing. We are going to start wrapping up. Does anyone who has not um, had an opportunity to invite their voice in this space like to say something? I just wanted to say thank you. It was such a nice story and you did such a good job and you should be very proud of yourself for writing this book. It's wonderful. You thank great. you so much. Thank you. Irene, I see your hand is raised. Do you have a question? You can be our... Yes. Um, I just want to say that a lot of the memories that everyone has shared are so many of mine that I'm just like busting out here in this hot apartment. But my question um, for you, Esmeralda, when you feel that you want to be in touch with your Puerto Ricanness. What is a comfort food or beverage that you look <laughs> for that instantly you feel like you're on the island, mm -hmm. smelling the the air there that is so different from out here? Right. What do you What do you look for? Well, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of things. You know, I mean, I have a lot of friends on the island, so I'll just zoom them, <laughs> or I'll Facetime them, or call them, or somehow stay in touch with them. I have a lot of Puerto Ricanas, you know, I have a very extensive community of women that I turn to 
when I when I need you know um, when I need them. Um, and of course, I'm there for them when they need me. So so I will. Um, that's how I go, I go to Puerto Rico by talking to my Puerto Rican friends who we share that experience. You know because I can I can talk to my Honduran friends. But, um, but it's very different when I talk to my Puerto Rican friends, mostly because the accent is different. Um, estamos hablando en español y yo hablo puertorriqueño, yo no hablo dominicano, yo no hablo chilena, yo no hablo argentina, ¿sabes? So, so those, that's one of the things that brings me back. The music always brings me back, and especially the, the, the very traditional music that I grew up with, really that I connect to my parents more than anything. I mean, that's, that, that the music that I, that I remember uh, as a little kid was not my music because once I came to New York, you know, I mean, you know, Motown, right? But, but in Puerto Rico, it was all those, you know, all those singers from that generation were the ones that I was familiar with. And so I go there um, with music. And then with food, you know, my, sit, my sisters, um, I'll just call them and say, I need Sancocho, you know? <laughs> and so she comes from the Bronx and she spends the weekend and she makes Sancocho. I don't really, I don't do a lot of, of uh, cooking in general, um, and, uh, but they do. So I just invite them to my house or I go to theirs and I eat there and I have, or my Puerto Rican friends, the same thing. Uh, so I just go, I just find whatever makes it possible for me to be there. I spend a lot of time online just looking at pictures of Puerto Rico, of my, um, of the time that I was there, of the, my parents' times, of course, because part of it is because it's research for the book that I'm doing, but also because I want to remember, you know, I do not want to forget any of it. And this is, I think, one of the, one of the questions that people often ask me is, how do you remember so much? You know, that you, you're writing about things that happened, you know, 50 years ago, 60 years ago. And I go, this is the curse of everyone around me is that I have a really good memory. <laughs> and, and, uh, you yeah. know, and it's a problem for some people, um, but that just happens to be the case. Um, and so, and then, then once I made the decision to be a writer, then I made the decision not to forget things when things were memorable. So, so those, are, those are the kinds of ways that bring me back. And then of course I try to go to the island when I can. And, uh, and that's a whole other, you know, there I'm there. I mean, I just, you know, el terruño, like we call, you know, you just want to touch that, esa tierra that actually you have to go to the El Campo because it's all cement now. Um, and, but you know, you can hear that I'm, I am a person of the rural, of rural Puerto Rico, and I really hate <laughs> the cities and the urbanizaciones and all that stuff. I, I hate being in that part of Puerto Rico because it, it feels to me like it could be anywhere, you know, but you put me out in the middle of the, in, in, una, in un barrio and, in, in, you know, somewhere in el campo, and that to me, I'm home um, because that's what I, that's where I grew up. Boricua! Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so, so much. Um, Ron, do you want to chime in at this? Yeah, so we're going to, I'm sorry, I know we got a couple more people with questions, but we're going to start wrapping it up. Um, earlier, um, uh, Esmeralda had asked me how long the, um, I, we expected Esmeralda to stay for an hour. Um, and she warned me, she does give lengthy, lengthy answers. Um, so uh, we appreciate the time that uh, Esmeralda has spent, Ms. Santiago, Esmeralda, Esmeralda Santiago has spent with us this evening. Uh, it's been a wonderful experience just uh, learning about your family as well as all the other characters in the book and you with this appearance sort of bringing us closer to your experience. So we deeply appreciate you connecting with us as readers, but also you, you know, giving your talents as a writer to the world. So um, I personally thank you, and I'm sure everyone else here uh, yeah. thanks, thanks you for this, um, this appearance. So thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. Thank, thank you, Ron, you and thank so you all. Bravo! You're, you're fabulous. Thank you so much. It really makes me, uh, 
it, it inspires me and motivates me. And so now tomorrow morning when I start writing, you all, your questions will still be rattling around my brain and I'll be answer, I'll still be answering you, by the way. <laughs> so thank you for the time. I can't wait. No, thank you. Uh, and again, thank you. And thanks Such so a good you. job. You did excellent. Yeah. Thank you, Susan. Brandon, and thanks yeah. to all the people. Mm -hmm. Brandon controlled it. <laughs> <laughs> And thanks to all the new faces. Please come back when we return in September. Um, we haven't picked out the lineup of books yet, but um, we try to pick a diverse selection of books. So um, definitely stay connected to us. And again, I just want to thank um, Esmeralda Santiago, as well as uh, Casita Maria. Gail Heidel is still here. Gail, I don't know if you want to say a few words in closing. Um, I would just welcome you all again, you know, to uh, you can either view the exhibition that we have in our gallery, um, which is the companion to Esmeralda's book uh, for the summer. Um, and you can go to casitamaria.org and view the exhibition, or you're welcome to email me and make an, a, uh, an appointment to view in person. Um, but thank you, Esmeralda, so much for being thank here. You. I read your book a few years ago and it, it really moved me. Um, so when Olga recommended it, I was like, yes. <laughs> I was really excited that I was going to be part of the club. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you, Gail. All of you. Really um, really and again, fun. thanks everybody who joined us throughout the year. And this was such a great event to close out the year on. So again, thank you, Esmeralda. Mm -hmm.